Um, my name is Steffi Dippold. Um, hello and welcome to Race and the Boundaries of the Book. Um, lovely that you were able to join us today via Zoom. Um, uh, before we start, let me quickly send a big thank you to our rare book school co-conspirators. And here I think especially of Laura Idam, Laura Parings, Neil Curtis, Robin Goldstein, and Barbara Heritage. You rock, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to RBS. Um, uh, my name is John Garcia, and I teach in the English department at Florida State University. Um, uh, so we want to keep the introductions uh, brief uh, so that we can hear from all the speakers today. Um, the seven uh, Biblio videos uh, that were produced by our panelists uh, cover a range of topics uh, that address race in early America in terms of the book and its many boundaries. Um, we hope that uh, as many of you that are here have been able to see the videos, uh, which are archived on the RBS YouTube channel. Uh, and so in keeping with the format, uh, our panelists today will briefly summarize the contents of the videos uh, in order to then proceed to their remarks. And of course, we're very grateful to the panelists for their generosity in sharing their work. Uh, and Steffi's just quickly going to tell us a little bit about uh, housekeeping things for, for the format of the event. Yep, um, so Rare Book School asks you to please keep your video feed turned off. Um, we also ask you to please hold on to your questions. Um, the chat will be activated at 540. And then we have 15 minutes, perhaps a little bit longer for Q and A um, at the end. And we will try of course to answer as many questions as we can. And then we will make sure if there are additional questions that they get to our presenters. Um, and John is now going to introduce our panelists. Yes, so uh, introductions are short and the, bi the biographies for the panelists, um, the longer ones are on uh, the RBS website. Uh, first up, of course, is uh, Steffi Dipold, uh, who teaches at Kansas State, uh, and she'll be speaking on the topic of indigenous bookbinding practices. By the way, the, um, the, the, the names that I'm reading off is the order that will be, um, that our presenters will be speaking today. Uh, also speaking, um, on the topic of Native American material culture, we have Michael Galbon, who is a curator at the Seneca Art and Culture Center at the uh, Conondagan State Historic Site. Tara Bynum, oh, sorry, Tara Bynum, uh, is Assistant Professor of English and African American Studies at the University of Iowa. Uh, and her bibli biblio video is uh, drawn, as I understand, from a 2018 article published in Early American Literature. Uh, following Dr. Bynum's presentation, uh, I will uh, speak briefly on the topic of Black papermakers uh, during the American Revolution. Uh, next up will be Derek Spires, Assistant Professor of English at Cornell University and author of a very important new book, The Practice of Citizenship, Black Politics and Print Culture in the Early United States, which was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2019. Philip Round is the John C. Gerber Chair in English at the University of Iowa and author of Remo Removable Type, Histories of the Book in Indian Country, which was awarded the James Russell Lowell Prize by the Modern Language Association. Also featured in Phil's video and uh, our next speaker after that is Alan Corbier, who is Assistant Professor of History at York University and formerly the executive director of the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation located in Machinging, I apologize if I mispronounced that, Machinging First Nation in Canada. And last but not least, we have John Pollock, curator and head of research services at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also facilitates the workshop in the history of material texts. And uh, many of you also will know John uh, as faculty at the Rubric School where he teaches a course uh, with Roger Chartier. Uh, and please join me in welcoming our panelists, and we'll begin with Steffi Dipold. Um, yeah, um, together in my short video, together with Michael Galban, uh, I explore a very early 
very small and very unassuming New England missionary text called The Indian Primer. And in 1669 on the Cambridge Press at Harvard College, um, this tiny booklet was a rather pragmatic, hardworking school book um, used to promote literacy in Wampanoag amongst Native American converts. Um, that is like Phil, Tara and John on the panel, I look at an utterly humdrum everyday book object and purposefully not at a volume that traditionally book collectors would have been eager to acquire. I find these small quotidian formats especially rich and fascinating because they allow us a glance into an everyday world um, and in my case, an early indigenous book culture that is often missing or ill represented in our collections. What is most surprising, in fact, about the Prima is that a copy actually has survived. More intriguingly, even this copy is how, um, housed at the University of Edinburgh, sits still in its original binding. And it is this the unusual materiality of this binding that fascinates me and that represents, as I suggest, an alternative hidden embodied material record that books forward as well, and on which I believe it is important to focus if we want to expand readings in our biased archives. Um, just very quickly, the Prima is bound in a typical unsophisticated, if you want, early American scaleboard binding in which cheap local and probably Native American materials replace traditional Western book binding materials. Um, very unusual are the dark ornaments and the lush white and probably brain tanned buckskin leather that envelopes the primer. And in my ongoing research and through various collaborations, I try to recover and contextualize the cultural, but also the chemical narratives um, embedded in this extraordinary binding. And let me turn over now to Michael Galban, an expert in Native American material culture who has fascinating things to say about indigenous belief systems and processes and of leather production. <clears throat> thank you, Steffi, um, and thank you for the invitation to uh, speak to you all today. Um, so when I was, when Steffi contacted me about this book, it was um, very interesting because the book transcends sort of the, the common perception of, of what is what it is you know it is a it's a written record it's a tool of uh, missionizing it's a uh, you know it's the Indian primer but it also becomes um, it, it's been it has been transformed through this intersection of uh, the European practice of book binding binding in leather skin animal skin and then decorated somehow you know, and it was very, very exciting to me to look at the binding and to imagine who possibly painted the designs on the binding and, and if they were indigenous, as they very likely were, um, what was the meaning behind it, you know, so we can look at the design motifs of the decorative elements and we can compare them. Uh, using, you know, comparative analysis and other Northeastern uh, design motifs, double curve motifs that you see often throughout history. And it all aims towards an indigenous artist, possibly the owner, uh, putting the designs on there. And so when we when we think of that, when I think of the, the materiality of that book and begin to speculate and imagine, you know, what was the meaning behind it? It's, it leads me into a few different areas of thought. One is that Native people uh, all over North America um, regarded animal skin and bindings of skin as protective. You know, they people made uh, bags to contain things special uh, out of skin. The animal, in some cases, some of the communities of the Northeast, the Haudenosaunee, for example, they had a tradition where uh, you might say 
medicine people could remove the skin from an animal and it would be able to be reanimated. And we see that in the, in the, in the storytelling uh, traditions, these uh, skin, the skin that can be reanimated has uh, uh, abilities in the stories and, and can protect the owner. And so I might imagine like that this skin is performing a similar um, function for the uh, indigenous owner. We, we might think of it in that way. Um, and when you when you alter the the uh, the hide and you decorate it, whether it's with you know uh, small glass beads or uh, porcupine quills or moose hair uh, embroidery or even painting, you know it's adding a secondary layer of meaning to the to the object. Uh, sometimes those are totally indecipherable because they were created by with the with uh, you know, so long ago when no one left us a uh, knowledge of what they could have meant. Were they protective? Were they um, emblematic? Did they represent the owner? Were they uh, representing the owner's family lineage or clan or community uh, or their name even? You know, those are questions that are unanswered, but we can uh, compare the designs and begin to imagine what that, what the potential of the meaning could be, you know? And so it was, it was very, it was very, um, a, it's a powerful image. It's a powerful object, uh, not only because it was touched by many hands, you know, but what it, it also, when, when I think about it, it also really reflects the era um, of that 17th century when the attitudes of native people, indigenous people, um, were accepting and inclusive of not just material like a uh, European animal hide, right, binding, or uh, iron axes and things that would you could use in your everyday life, but also in ideology. And Native people, we know of the period, incorporated ideas of Christian thought into their own uh, worldviews, and they were, um, they jumped between them and moved between them with ease, they didn't have the the uh, rigidness. I think that some people uh, ascribe to native thought that it was totally opposed, diametrically opposed to Christian thought. I mean, and so to have an object decorated in indigenous design and meant to be uh, to teach uh, Christian uh, thought and ideology, you know, but combined with the indigenous um, designs, possibly protective, whatever. Um, to me spoke to that intersection of thought. And um, for me, it was a very powerful, it, it, it's a very powerful object that has lots of stories to tell um, that don't exist between the, uh, the boards. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Tara Bynum. Good afternoon and thank you all for um, watching my video. Thank you all for convening with us here today. I thought it made the most sense to speak about how I happened upon Caesar Linden's Sundry account book. Um, and it was really with the help of the Rhode Island Historical Society, and in particular, Alyssa Tardif and Suzanne McCormick, who ran a NEH Summer Institute there in 2015. And both of them knew my interest in of Black people having fun in the 18th century. I think that that's a super simplified way of speaking about this interest. But it, it my engagement with Caesar Linden started with a passing conversation about a pig roast and the, the receipt that was left in this Black man's account book. The, the pig roast happens August 12, 1766. And I, I looked at the single page and kind of assumed that that was all there was to it. Of course, that was not, not the best sort of assumption to make. And ultimately, when I actually saw the full book, you know, I saw a 30 some odd page document that didn't make any immediate sense to me. And it got me thinking about, you know, why I think my initial thought was what sorts of engagement are possible with this kind of book. I'd never thought about an account book as anything of, of real concern or interest, especially to thinking about my 
literary critical sensibilities. And I think that one of the cool things for me about Caesar Linden's account book, which spans 1761 to 1771, um, at least in its extant form, I think it was an opportunity for me to, it was an opportunity for me to, to play around with what I even understood a book to be. It was an opportunity for me to play around with the form itself. And what, what do you learn about somebody looking at their account book? On the one hand, you know, I think that there's a robust conversation that we can have about the mundane. And I think that the mundane can sound really dry sometimes, but I think it's in the mundane that you learn about somebody's life. When you see how much ketchup they're actually, that, how much ketchup is actually being sold. Um, and then there are all these questions about like, what does ketchup look like in 1765? Um, it does not look like Heinz. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I, I, I ended up doing a deep dive into it for a hot second. It, it doesn't seem particularly tasty. I think it's mushroom based. Somebody can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but ultimately I became completely in the ways that we do that are so familiar to us, especially those of us who deal in archival libraries and historical society libraries and their holdings. You know, I think that I became obsessed with figuring out, cracking the code of what an account book is, why there were columns, why there were these big hatch marks and X's. And I also then became that much more struck by who Caesar Linden was engaging with and realizing that his account holders are Newport's big time slave traders. And if you know anything about Newport in the 18th century, you know that Newport is a major hub of, of colonial, colonial American slave trading. That changes later, but in Caesar Linden's day, he is in a hot spot. So to imagine that he is, he is selling goods and services to, to Christopher Champlin, Aaron Lopez, and a host of others, as well as to um, other black people, an indigenous woman here, a mulatto woman there, and he specifies this in particular, um, opened up a whole new world to me. And if, you know, if we had more time, I would play Six Degrees of Separation with Phyllis Wheatley because Caesar Linden can in fact, <laughs> Caesar Linden can in fact do that. And I think that that then opened up even more this huge world of, of Black New England communities that, you know, in the way that I'm always wanting to do, lifts Phyllis Wheatley out of the frontispiece into this robust community. Um, and it's a fun game to play. Anyways, I won't get caught up in that. But I think ultimately, I, Caesar Linden's account book has, has for me been an opportunity to have me ask those questions that I posed before, like what constitutes a book? The fact that it's still in manuscript was never meant to be printed. Do we put it in the African American literary canon, um, or is it something that you know we leave to the historians of capitalism to uh, mess around with? I, I definitely think that there's space for it, and I see it, in fact, as a as a real invitation into the stories that the account book form tells into rethinking ideas about what um, what the account book as a genre um, might hold in it. I think that there are other opportunities too to imagine early African-American writing in this account book form. So, you know, Phyllis Wheatley keeps accounts with Uber Tanner and I think Samuel Hopkins about how many books are sold. So like, might we think about her letters as a kind of accounting. Benjamin Banneker also keeps an account book. And once you start playing this game, suddenly there are all these opportunities to, to think about the account book as a very real part of um, early African-American writing more broadly, even if, you know, at first glance, it might be easy to read quickly past the fact that, you know, 300 of Wheatley's books end up coming off the ship on a particular day. Um, so in sum, Caesar Linden's account book is great. And my, my hope is to get everybody put on to Caesar Linden's account book. Right now you have to go to the Rhode Island Historical Society to see it, or you can send me a nice email and I can potentially figure out how to email it to you. Anyways, uh, <laughs> thanks so much again for watching the video. If you haven't watched it, please do. 
And I look forward to our conversation about all of these items that, that we have put before you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Wonderful, and uh, I, I definitely think that Tara gets the award for, for best uh, production on a video because I was so jealous uh, when, I, when I heard the soundtrack, which is just, you know, it just sounds amazing. Um, I, I, so my, um, my contribution here, um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of overlap between the various presentations. Um, when, uh, when Tara talks about account books, um, I've, I'm excited in these kinds of materials as well. Um, and I do think that there's a lot of interesting work being done uh, uh, at the moment on the 18th century um, and the relationship between the book trade and slavery. Um, and so uh, uh, apart from my own work, I, I would just say that I've been personally very much inspired and influenced by a book by Sean Moore uh, called Slavery in the Making of Early American Libraries. If you don't know it, it's a very, it's a very um, informative uh, volume which talks about places like Newport, Rhode Island uh, and, and the role of social and circulating libraries. Uh, but at any rate, uh, my video um, essentially uh, tries to recover the lives and experiences as much as I can of two African-American men who worked in a paper mill outside of Boston during the period of the Revolutionary War. Both of these men ran away from the paper mill uh, and one seems to have had an injury that could potentially have been a result of an accident sustained while making paper. The other man was a free black man named James Moody, who also escaped, but he did uh, uh, something extraordinary, which is that it seems as though he joined the crew of a, of a Revolutionary War battleship, the USS Alliance, and he fought the, uh, the British Navy aboard this ship on the voyage to France. My larger interest uh, in, in these kinds of things is, uh, is to find stories of black laborers in the early American book trade. And uh, I do think that uh, the best place to find them is, are in account books and receipts. Uh, more generally, uh, you know, I, I'm asking a question in my work of which early American printers and booksellers engaged in slavery and or employed black laborers. And it turns out there are many, there are many of them. Uh, and I can just compile quickly, just run down a short list of them uh, if you're interested. So Daniel Henchman, the uh, well-known uh, Boston uh, bookseller in the 1720s and 1730s, uh, purchased a Native American slave and also owned a black servant. Thomas Fleet from Boston in the 1740s is also well known from Isaiah Thomas of having employed uh, two black pressmen, uh, a father and son, one of whose initials appears on an engraving for a children's book, uh, uh, which is probably the earliest known uh, illustration printed by an enslaved person. Uh, James Boyes and Hugh McLean are mentioned in my video, uh, two uh, Boston area paper mill owners who participated in slavery. Daniel Fowle of New Hampshire is more well known uh, because uh, he uh, owned an enslaved man named Primus Fowle who printed the New Hampshire Gazette in the 1770s. If we move forward into the uh, early national period, the Grand Federal Procession, which was held in 1788 in Philadelphia to celebrate the ratification of the Constitution apparently hired two black men to help pull the printer's float that was used to celebrate the contribution of printing and publishing to the new nation. And we can keep going forward in the 1790s, a man named Samuel Campbell, a very well-known New York printer, uh, uh, seems to have owned uh, and, and employed uh, a number of black servants, so much so that in, the, uh, in his papers, uh, there is a, a map of his estate and this printer's estate included a house for to house his uh, his uh, what I imagine are enslaved servants. Some of them, by the way, are indentured. But at any rate, uh, there is a long list that can be compiled. And I want to just conclude by saying that I, I'm thinking about this in terms of our contemporary moment. And as I'm working on this, I really think the title of this uh, piece should have been "Essential Workers," because, to my mind, these uh, these subjects that I'm recovering are the essential workers of the book trade, even though they're not themselves printing themselves, but they are doing necessary work. Thank you. And up next is uh, Derek. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me to be in this space and thanks to all of you good people for tuning in, um, whatever time of wherever place you are. Um, I spoke about Dorena Lee um, and Dorena Lee's um, narrative is not rare, 
necessarily. Um, it's pretty widely available at this point, but I think her life experience and gospel labors gets to a lot of the pressure points around race and the possibilities of the book in print. And it does so in part because um, to talk about during the Lee's narrative, life experience and gospel labors is to talk about race, but also gender and status and institutions. So we're talking about a black woman in a particular religious and institutional context who's going into print largely through her own efforts and financing, but who also consistently tries to get institutional backing and through the AME church in particular and um, navigating the politics of whether she's an exhorter or a preacher and what that means, navigating the context of whether she can um, have the AME, what becomes the AME book concern back the publication of her expanded book and what that would have meant for that book versus the self-published form. Um, it gets us thinking about the travel of books and people and print and messages because we the version I work off of for life experience and gospel labors is printed in Cincinnati, Ohio, though the copyright is in Philadelphia. Um, so she sold as she traveled and sold out. There was demand, so she commissioned another printing. Um, and so just thinking about Lee as an entrepreneur in that sense. Um, Lee's story, the story of this text is also the story of a field. So I encountered Lee first in um, Dorothy Porter's early Negro writings and there she is. There's a great version of this that has Lee as the complete cover page, but I, every time I try to order it, it turns out to be something else. Um, but you can run a three line of people who write about Lee and as pillars of African-American print culture study. So Dorothy Porter, Francis Smith Foster, Carla Peterson, Joyce Lee Moody, and the line goes on. Um, she becomes a sort of, not an avatar, but a linchpin again, because life experience and gospel labor does so much work in terms of navigating all of the elements of book publication, pamphlet publication in her moment. Um, and then Lee herself is so savvy in the way she has the pamphlet composed. The title is a callback to Richard Allen, who like three years before her publishes his life and religious experience. The cover, the, the, the visual image of Lee at the desk with pen in hand with books is a callback to both Allen and Phyllis Wheatley, degrees of separation between anybody and Phyllis Wheatley. Here we go. Um, and so she is, she is both crafting her own text, but also crafting it within a print tradition, um, pretty consciously. Um, and so I think I will leave it there. Um, she expands it in 1849 into a hardbound, much longer book, but um, we're talking about pamphlet. So I'm gonna leave it with the pamphlet. And, uh... Thank you. Uh, I believe next uh, it's Phil Round's turn. Thanks a lot, John. I, I, it's a great pleasure to be uh, doing this with you guys. And I thank you and Steffi for inviting John, uh, Al and I to participate. It was uh, part of the fun of this part of uh, my work in book history or, or book studies in uh, indigenous uh, context is to be able to work with guys like Al. And uh, I'm going to let Al have the bulk of the time there. He knows what he's talking about when it comes to the material we're working on, particularly because I, if Al rewatched the video, he'll know that um, he pointed out to me on the first uh, cut that, uh, Phil, you mispronounced the name of the book every time. And I said, well, leave it to a non-Ojibwe guy to do that, you know? And then I went back and I uh, started using my audition software and I was punching in the Ojibwe word in my voice every time. And I said, forget about it, okay? Let's just have the white guy mispronounce the Ojibwe book all the way through this uh, video so that it can be correct culturally correct. So when you get to Al, he'll tell you what I said wrong. But what interested me, and Al and I've been kind of back and forth communicating on chat and and, and text over the last couple of years about things I'll find and he'll find in, in Canadian archives that have to do with Ojibwe language texts. My latest project I'm going to be finishing up this year has to do with scripts in vernacular language, whether they're syllabary scripts or um, uh, alphabetic scripts. 
And I'm very interested in the way those two have a materiality that is probably underappreciated by everyday uh, book historians who look at a native text and don't appreciate how material a syllabary is and how even a vernacular alphabetic text becomes a material act because in its production as a written form in handwriting and as its rather sometimes complicated production as a, a typographic um, font, uh, they become quite quite contested spaces, both within native communities and outside of them. So the particular book we looked at really represents a constellation of really interesting vernacular language texts in Ojibwe and Cree, which are cognate languages, and both in Canada and in the United States. Uh, Al's community there has a lot of people moving in and out from places in Michigan today called uh, Arbor, de, uh, Arbor Cross, right, Al? Uh, and, and so there's like a, there's really not a national boundary there for the Ojibwe peoples in the period that we've drawn the national boundary. And these books are circulating across that whole region. Some are published in Detroit. Some are published uh, by job printers uh, there. Some are published down in, I saw, saw one today in Oberlin. Uh, oh, you know, so there's a lot of really offbeat places for these things being published. This particular one we're looking at attracted me for this project because it, there's a lot of tantalizing material in the metadata that suggests that women in Al's community uh, in that period actually hand sewed the, the texts, some of them, and also may have done the bindings. Now the bindings are very different across the editions we have. In the film, I had to use bindings from an online archive because I no longer have access to the Newberry archive in person. I couldn't get a good, big, a good picture of that. But talking with Stiffy, who knows a lot about, uh, what's that thing called? The stitch, the punch binding thing. There's all these different things going on in the book that interested me. And in the metadata, uh, there's a, information potentially about women being involved, other people being involved. So I wanted to get Al involved so he could take us into the Montreal archives of the Jesuits and tell us a bit, a bit about that. I also see this book as representing a whole bunch of other books. There's a really cool eelskin, uh, Cree syllabary uh, book that's done in the 1840s up in uh, the way, way up north at uh, the Norway house, Al. I don't know if you know that up, way up in the north part of Ontario. And then there's some deerskin bindings and then there's some unbound. You know, there's just a real variety of things. Some of them, as uh, Michael mentioned, will have special significance to the native communities. That eel really intrigues me because eel could have a very, very potent significance if, if that turns out to be what this binding is. So I'm traveling around the country and in Al's country, looking at these archives and looking at vernacular language texts and realizing as you see in the video that these texts are no longer uh, the missionaries texts. These texts have become uh, Al's communities texts and other communities texts, and then they become more than texts. Um, the hymns are still sung in some places, and the books themselves um, uh, still circulate in various forms among community members. So uh, I'm going to turn my, the rest of my time over to Al and just say what a pleasure it is to work with all of you. And also a shout out to Dr. Tara Bynum, who has just joined my department, and she's really uh, you know, kicked it up a notch around there. So thanks very much, Tara. Al. All right. Uh... Uh, I have to say thank you first for inviting me to this panel and for Phil taking the time and having uh, patience and perseverance to continue working with this material. I, I found it interesting. Uh, I had uh, done research on uh, our historic writing practices here and I, I published an article a while ago about it. And uh, of course, we, we know that the majority of the, the uh, orthography was developed by different priests. Uh, years ago, I had gone to an Algonquian conference and it was uh, out west and I had listened to Chris Wolfhart, who is a, a linguist working in the Cree, Plains Cree language. And his presentation was talking about, uh, he mentioned that he was called as an expert witness in a treaty court case, a contemporary treaty court case. And what he had mentioned there, he says that at, by the time the treaties were signed out west here, the Bible had already been translated uh, at least 50 to 100 years ago in Cree. And the, the, the actual interpreters at the time were fur traders 
or the priests. And he said, and in fact, I have uh, the journal of the priest. He said that I went down to the lake uh, to collect my thoughts on how I'm going to translate this. So, but he says, but where is this? Where is his notes to translate the treaty? And he noted as well that uh, in Europe at the time, the practice was to have three copies of the treaty in three different languages so that if there were a dispute, they would uh, fall back on the French copy. So if there was a treaty between uh, Spain and Germany, there'd be a Spanish version and a German version, but also the French version. So he said, how come there wasn't a Cree version and an English version in, of this treaty? And so that's what where I'm coming from with this, uh, why I looked at historic uh, studies of uh, bib biblical translations, because I thought, well, they're translating foreign concepts and ideas that we never really encountered. And how did they do that? And it serves more or less as a template to look at how they would have possibly translated uh, uh, information that they had to convey in treaty uh, negotiations. And then to now look at that today, as it has, of course, uh, huge ramifications on how they would have translated that and how they uh, translate it now. There are, of course, two different ways of, of, uh, of uh, looking at the, the, the product end product of that written tradition. Anyway, that's what I've been looking at in there in these uh, translations is how they would have translated these different concepts, especially geographical terms, when we actually would have used more uh, natural landmarks like uh, rivers and mountain ranges. But of course, when they're surveying, this became a big issue because we, uh, our ancestors here, uh, Anishinaabe ancestors, only knew leagues, the French leagues, not miles. And then in the treaty, the, the treaties are written as miles. So even just the concept of measurement is, uh, is different because of our interaction. We interacted with the French up here more than we did with the, uh, the British at that point in time. So that's what, what my emphasis has been on is to try and mine some of those, uh, the way that they had uh, written about uh, our interaction. The second reason was that uh, actually on Manitoulin here in Canada, the chiefs sent their sons to be uh, trained to read and write in Ojibwe at that time. So they had their own scribes because they, they learned pretty quickly that uh, what was being written in English wasn't necessarily what they had said. So they wanted to make sure that what they, they had a version of what uh, of their account in their own words. So oftentimes they had uh, one of their sons who would later on become the chief who was able to write in Ojibwe at that time. So it, it makes a valuable contribution to our current understanding when we look at uh, how these events were recorded, uh, sometimes verbatim and sometimes at uh, uh, written deliberately afterward, after the event. But uh, it is a, a written record. And so there's a English or a Anglican orthography and there's also a French orthography. So you actually have to learn how to navigate between these different orthographies that are deployed. Uh, and that is what the, these uh, biblical translations and, and, and uh, looking at that evolution uh, evidenced in different Bibles uh, and hymnals and written scripts uh, used for missionary purposes. But our chiefs uh, back then used, some of them were who were Baptists, used a different writing system, Methodists used a different writing system, and Roman Catholic used a different writing system. So you got to familiarize yourself with all those systems basically to bring that up to today's, uh, make it meaningful to today's uh, scholars. So again, thank you all the rest of you on the panel and the organizers and to Phil for inviting me to participate. Uh, miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and uh, up next is uh, John Pollock, but I just want to just make a quick announcement to the audience. Um, uh, the uh, chat function will be activated uh, in one minute at 540. Uh, so uh, as soon as you see that available, uh, feel free to enter in any questions you want to propose for the Q&A into the chat. 
and and once uh, once our presenters are done, uh, we will then have a moderator for the question and answer session. So we look forward to that. Uh, and now we'll turn it over to to John Pollock. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, John. Um, it's it's um, wonderful to be last in a way because I'm furiously writing and learning from everybody. So thanks, first of all, to organizers and everybody for your amazing contributions. I did want to. I think we should give a shout out to to Michael Hua, who is not joining us today, but whose great piece on uh, pamphlet circulation of slave narratives um, is well worth uh, listening to if you have a chance. So, um, my my piece pales by comparison because it uh, doesn't really represent sustained research, but rather a kind of thought experiment. I think about about format. Um, which was the, the sort of original prompt of Steffi and John here. And I take, uh, well, we've heard a lot about sort of the famous and the neglected uh, over the course of these, these presentations. Um, I take two of the most famous uh, examples of one of the most famous documents, uh, famously kept uh, quite, uh, you know, under lock and key in famous libraries. Um, so really the opposite of, of boundary pushing, you might say. Uh, and, and, I, and I take a look at them. So these are two emancipation proclamations. And I think we can think about that emancipation proclamation in the plural. And I'm simply sort of asking myself, asking all of us what questions we could ask about them uh, based on their formats. Uh, how do we measure even the impact of uh, the proclamation, if we can even call it that, based on the physical examples that survive? What are the sociologies uh, of these texts and the sort of famous rare book school formulation of Don McKenzie that some of us may know? The two case studies are um, the Leland Bakker broadside, which is um, a collector's piece printed for a fundraising fair in 1864 in Philadelphia uh, in 48 copies signed by Abraham Lincoln. It's a broadside, but it was really always meant as a precious collector's item. And today copies fetch six figures uh, on the market if you can even find one. Uh, that is sold. So it's, it's an extraordinary rarity. And uh, though, of course, physically connected to Lincoln and um, uh, in, in that sense, at, at the same time, uh, extraordinarily removed, one could say, from, uh, from, the, from the actual practice and project of uh, freeing enslaved Americans. The other contrasting document I look at is often called the Miniature Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and it is a tiny uh, piece that fits in the palm of your hand, um, printed at the end of 1863 in Boston by John Murray Forbes. Um, we have one surviving letter that attests possibly to how this little pamphlet circulated and why it was made. That surviving letter by Forbes's daughter quoting Forbes suggests that it was intended, printed and intended to be uh, just given to thousands upon thousands of Union soldiers who would distribute it through the South. So it's a, it's a fascinating uh, story and arguably myth of book history and historical circulation. And I spend a little time thinking about this uh, evidence and thanks to Michael Winship, who many of us know, uh, we can raise some questions about whether the, the miniature that survives is actually the thing that might or might not have been distributed. So my point in doing some of these things is to raise some questions about format and meaning. Um, does big and grand, uh, what does big and grand mean versus little and small? How do we uh, balance famous versus neglected? Um, are pamphlets always the rarest things? They may be, but they may not always be. Um, and finally, and more broadly, uh, in my title, proclaiming, you know, what's the relationship between proclaiming a thing, printing a thing, and doing work, doing the work of freeing African-Americans 
uh, after the Civil War. We sometimes take these documents as acts in themselves, but they only do a certain kind of work. And I think we ourselves have a lot of work to do to understand them uh, and, and, and their many contexts. So I hope that's a charge to everybody because I feel like we've learned so much here about all the new kinds of work that all of you are doing to explore new formats and forgotten as well as known text. Thanks everybody. Thank you all um, for your summaries of your uh, projects. Um, so the chat is now open and I already discovered a couple of really intriguing questions. I would love to start with the question by Jim Stokes, who's, who writes, please, I'm curious in how the Pellandists define the word boundaries in the context of the title of of these discussions. So how do we think and um, conceptualize in different ways the term boundaries? Boundaries of where we keep these things. Um, one of the wonderful things is that we, a lot of you are looking beyond traditional archives, traditional keeping places to find material to study. Uh, at the same time, boundaries of discipline. Um, an account book uh, is a kind of literature. A, uh, slave narratives expand beyond the book format. Uh, so I, I see a lot of challenges to boundaries. Well, and in my case, for sure, I look at literal boundaries. What is the binding? What, in which way can we expand a text? And do we have to expand the concept of text or book to uh, bindings and the, and the narratives covers um, hold in the book as an artifact? Okay. I would just add quickly that, that uh, at least for my own work, I've been thinking a lot about space uh, and, uh, and trying to find uh, connected spaces to printing and publishing in the history of the book. Um, so just to add to the, the idea of boundaries, um, the, the phrase that I've often used and um, I found quite useful is the idea of looking at the vicinity, um, not necessarily the, 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 the printing press itself, um, but what's happening in the broader area um, and what kind of connections can be made there? Sorry, I, I, I feel like I may have um, cut off. Is it, was it Phil? Did you have something to say? Or... Uh, for me, I, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's important, uh, a term like boundary, because when, uh, as an Indigenous person working within Indigenous communities, my own community and, and communities of my wife's, um, Boundaries exist because uh, knowledge is not always open to everybody. And that's very different than the Western sort of model of learning. And it's complicated and it becomes difficult for Western learners to accept that indigenous people, we have knowledge which is, cannot be accessed, should not be accessed, impolite to even attempt to access. Mm -hmm. And when uh, an indigenous person is informing you about something and they may have special uh, boundaries for you. They may be making an exception to you uh, for some reason. They feel that you've, um, that you, you can, you're, uh, that they are entrusting you with uh, something and, and yet they may say to not use it. You know, they're telling you for your own knowledge because you seek knowledge and so, uh, at least in some native communities, these boundaries exist. They're unspoken in many cases, um, but it's a, it can be a, a challenge for an outsider uh, researcher to understand them. Um, and uh, when you work with native communities, it's always good to make your best attempts at learning their language. We've had to learn yours. I'd like to uh, chime in there. Uh, 
one of the things the other uh, the, Cent the, the Franciscans who were stationed at Harbor Springs in Upper State Michigan used to run a newsletter called uh, Anishinaabe Enemad. That means the, the praying Indian or the praying native person. And at the back of this uh, newsletter that would get mailed out, it would uh, list, uh, it, would, it was called Enkamagak, the happenings. And it would say from different communities who got married or who passed away. And this had a subscription list that actually people in Cape Croker, which is on the Bruce Peninsula and Lake Huron in Ontario, and it spanned to Michigan, upper, the upper peninsula of Michigan, and then the North shore of Lake uh, uh, Superior. So there was a wide swath of people that were connected. And this, oh, I forgot to say that this was all written in Ojibwe. So back then, of course, there was, this was at the turn of the uh, 20th century, 1890s up to, I think the last issue was like 1910. But the, these uh, newsletters were actually spreading uh, not only stories of uh, salvation or good death, what they call the term, the good death, but also who passed away and who got married and, and uh, how many children people were born and they would have had relatives that it was basically informing people across these boundaries of water, uh, of uh, state, nation states, but also communities as well. So that's the, as you all know, that's uh, the power of writing uh, in a sense is uh, uh, transmitting information across vast areas and across vast times. Maybe I, I move to the next question, and there I would like to um, link two uh, questions, both for Tara. Uh, one question is, um, is there a novel lurking in, in, in your account book? And the other is, do we often see in account, account books that include personal biographical information? So I don't know about a novel. Um, I'm sure someone could find a novel in that account book. Uh, but I'll say that account books are an interesting genre in that they kind of, a, um, I think more widely are diaries, journals, and number, number crunching devices, oftentimes all in one. Um, and it, I, I, I've learned that it's very much tied to the account book holders provocative. So even how they organize, how an individual person organizes the account book is very person specific. So Caesar Linden's has a lot of um, personal information and information that isn't necessarily tied to numbers in the way of a diary, but it is not unique to Linden um, and is I think very much a part of kind of the the way that account books, um, kind of even the name of them are a real accounting of someone's everyday life. So sometimes it's about the numbers they need to crunch in a particular day, but other times it's about, you know, kind of their wife and her friend going to see a friend up the road. So on the one hand, it's not completely unique to Lyndon, but I think what makes Lyndon's account book compelling and interesting is that it is, um, the extant account book of a uh, middle of the 18th century enslaved black man. Thank you, Tara. I, I also would like to um, squeeze together the next two questions. So, um, because they overlap a little bit. So here the question is, um, how can, what can librarians and scholars and um, um, other um, others, how can they look for to what do they need to look for to identify unexpected meaningful marks on collection items and artifacts? So how do we discover materials on the limits of the archive? Um, and what can librarians, historians and archivists do to make a move to preserve some of our most recent or local histories? Um, Maybe somebody would like to take a stab on one of 
one of these questions. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, those are great questions. And I think, um, well, we can hear it both in Steffi's paper and, and it, uh, in Phil, Philip and Alan's work too about, you know, sort of, the, it's funny, it's a kind of return to the whole book, you know, it, 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 we, we decontextualize our objects often with library catalog records and it's um, the invitation to look at not just book bindings, plural, but book binding singular, each object as an individual piece with a new, its own story. Uh, like Steffi and Michael are trying to tell us about one surviving exemplar um, is, is presents a real challenge to how we describe things uh, in libraries, which uh, tend to be, um, tend to emphasize what's common among multiples rather than what's specific and unique. And, and I think, you know, those are not easily answered questions. Certainly a lot of people are thinking about uh, new visual ways of representation, as, uh, but we also need to continue to generate new questions because we don't know what we want to look for yet. So, I mean, I, I think it's it's about, in terms on the archive side, being as open as possible to to different kinds of questions, different voices we didn't expect, or we didn't traditionally assume would be there. Um, the other part of the question. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, and there is a rare book school course devoted to this community archiving is a very important field among um, our archivist colleagues um, and the notion of preserving local memory and what an institution can or can or should or should not do um, is, is crucial. I mean, you know, from, from the Rhode Island Historical Society to the many local historical societies, clubs, uh, organizations without formal status, churches, um, places on Manitoulin Island that, you know, are in no way considered <laughs> archives in that formal sense, but are very much memory, places of memory. I, I think we have to, we, all of us have to be very open to, to those knowledges. And, and as Michael says, share what we can share, even if we acknowledge we can't share everything or shouldn't share everything. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Sorry, go ahead, John. No, no, please. I was just going to add, um, even copies of ubiquitous text can become really important, not necessarily for like printing and sort of original issues, but because of things like annotations and signatures, um, especially local copies. You, it's Langston Hughes. You'll find Langston Hughes collections all over the place because Langston Hughes would carry along his um, collections and giving them away or signing them away. Same thing with Gwendolyn Brooks. I mean, that becomes a really important way of localizing the history of a text or figure who seems not local. Uh, another example of this would be Du Bois's copy of David Walker's Appeal at Emory. Um, and so just paying attention to even if there's a box of books from a local lit organization or a library, just going through the pages to see what's there. Never know. I mean, never know whose signature may or may not be important or whose markings may or may not matter later. I also think that to, in my view, it's important to remember that even if communities and their organizations in, I think that communities and their organizations, even if they aren't naming themselves an archive, they're often doing the work of, of saving their memories in some way, shape or form. So if I go back in time, cause I'm always back in time, um, like Caesar Linden is a part of this Newport black community. And eventually some years after the account book, he will be a part of an organization called the Free African Union Society. And they keep their minutes, they keep their letters, they, they know that they are doing something. So I also think that part of what we, what we need to do um, present day is kind of remember that it's always the case that people are saving pieces of themselves, um, even if they aren't naming themselves the, the archivist for their family or the librarian for their family um, or their church or whatever, there's, there's, 
think a very kind of community oriented impulse to um, to remember in that way and to keep in that way. And I think that we we you know to kind of return to the idea of boundaries need to think expansively about the fact that people are always remembering themselves. So it's our responsibility to to help them maybe even understand the the public importance of what it is that they are looking to remember. I'm wondering, we probably can squeeze in um, one more um, question. Um, and Cindy Klein asks, did African-Americans or indigenous people who were working in the printing binding process as enslaved labor or indentured labor ever progress into the industry as non-enslaved or non-indentured laborers? Did they use these skills to advance their situations? James Printer, you can talk about James Printer. Famous uh, indigenous printer in early Boston very much on the title pages. Well, that's kind of interesting too, because you'll find once the uh, industrial schools are started in the United States for Native American kids, uh, um, one of the stranger elements of industrial education by the standards of the US government then was the printing press work. And so there are lots of printing done in the 1860s and 70s in Dakota Lakota country, in Dakota Lakota languages, and they're done at Santee Normal School by Lakota kids who then grow up, some of them to be either writers or to work in the printing business in some fashion. I have not followed them through, but this is quite a common story in the United States uh, education system for Native peoples in the 1850s through the 1890s. You also find a lot of tantalizing clues in the works of itinerant uh, Baptist printers like Jotham Meeker down in Kansas. He definitely hired native people to do the set, set up work at his press. And of course, all of this translation materials, as Michael mentioned, the language capabilities of the native uh, workers were essential for these missionary endeavors. So in Al's case, to get all these different kinds of orthographies and type set correctly, you have to have somebody like Al who can, uh, yeah, you need an Episcopal typesetter. I'm right here in Ojibwe. Hey, you need a Catholic one? Hey, I got it covered. You know, Al could get a hell of a job nowadays with all of his knowledge of these different orthographies. He'll never be out of work, right? And so it's true, The again, though, pushing the boundaries, these people are hard to tell their story. It's hard to track them down. Um, I wish I had another lifetime to do so because there's so many intriguing little passages I found where, yes, these, so, these Indian women that are mentioned in the metadata for the book Al and I talk about, who were they and where are they now? You know, where are their ancestors and, and what did they do? So it would be a wonderful thing to follow up on. It also involves an enormous amount of work. <laughs> Um, and just, you know, uh, as, as, as I'm thinking, as we're towards the end of the panel, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we, we, we are all kind of amazed by the, um, the depth of research that our panelists have engaged in. I mean, I, I think of Derek's book and I think of Phil's book uh, and, and, and everybody else's work. I mean, this takes a lot of time. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's something that I, I, I think is, should be acknowledged. Um, but it's also time that, that and, and work that also is very much uh, something that we benefit from the work of curators and librarians and all the people that help us bring these things to us. 